and welcome to a very special episode of Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. Our hope, as always, through everything we do, is that through honest conversation and information, we can strip away some of the stigma that sometimes comes hand in hand with infertility and fertility treatment in Ireland. I'm your host, Renee Van Bedding, and today on this very special episode, I have the pleasure of sitting down with the world's first IVF baby, Louise Brown. Louise, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. It's very, very exciting for all of us to have you here and for myself as mother to two, two babies born through IVF, um, it's just um, such an honour to have you here, so thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so most people watching this may know who you are, but for those who don't, maybe you could just tell them a little bit about yourself and how you came to be sitting here in Therapy Fertility today. Um, so my name's Louise Brown and I'm the world's first IVF baby. Um, my mum tried for nine years um, to get pregnant and wasn't successful, so she went to her local um, GP mm-hmm. who diagnosed her with depression through not being able to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, so they then um, recommended my mum go to see a gynaecologist specialist, yep. which um, was again in my hometown of Bristol. Mm-hmm. Um, my mum went for a meeting with, I think her name was Dr Hinton, and then um, Dr Hinton had heard of the wonderful work that Bob Edwards and Patrick Steptoe and Jean Purdy were trying were trying to get a programme up together. So um, she said to mum that she would contact Patrick to see if um, mum could have a meeting with him up mm-hmm. in Oldham, mm-hmm. which happened, um, and... Um, he accepted her onto the program. Um, Mum had to have an operation to remove her fallopian tubes because they were damaged um, before she could start the IVF program, which um, they managed because Dad had won the football pools five hundred pounds at the time, so that <laughs> managed to pay for the operation that wow. Mum needed. And then Patrick accepted her Mum and Dad onto the program, and here I am. <laughs> it's just incredible and at the time did your parents have any idea that they were you know involved in something that was absolutely groundbreaking or were they just you know wanting to have a baby and um at the time um I'm pretty sure that Patrick would have gone through everything step by step mm. with mum and I know she had to sign lots of bits of paperwork and things because again it was a, just a trial yeah and um she didn't every time she went up to see him there was always pregnant ladies and babies there because he was a gynecologist so um i she didn't realize it had so she worked. probably just figured all of these pregnant people are all part the of the same, same trial yeah. and yeah and then i think it was it's six months pregnant somebody released mum's name to the press mm. And I think that was when it sort of finally sunk in because then um, Patrick and Bob asked mum to stay up in Oldham mm. so that they knew she was safe. Yeah. But I believe a couple of weeks before I was due to be born, there um, the press did a bomb scare because they were hoping, they had obviously had mum's name, mum and dad's name, but they didn't have any photographs. So they were trying to... So they tried to get, obviously with a bomb scare, they thought they'll, they'll take everybody out. And they wow. did, but mum and dad, they were back ways in tunnels yeah. in the hospital and mum and dad went the back way, so they still didn't get any pictures. So how was that for, for your parents at the time? I mean, I guess there must have been... I think they were probably, mum was probably pretty scared mm. because you think, I mean, she was pregnant, heavily pregnant mm. by then. Um, well, having the baby that she'd wanted for over 10 years and then there's a bomb scare, I mean pretty sure she would have been she was quite a quiet lady anyway Mm. um so I should imagine she was pretty scared but then saying that Bob and Patrick I mean she trusted Patrick for the moment she met him she trusted him Mm. and she knew he she'd always said to me he will help he I knew he'd um help me have a baby yeah yeah um and so when you were born there was obviously a lot of excitement, a lot of media attention. Um, at what point did your parents start, you know, traveling around and kind of, <coughs> I suppose, sharing you with, with the rest of the world? Um, 
I think I was about six months old mm. when we went to America. Mm. We did Canada, we did America, um, we did Japan. Wow. I know there's, I can't remember anything of it, but I've seen footage and I was walking by eight months old. I was like toddling around. Wow. And there's a picture of me on, the, um, on a show in America and there was an audience um, like set up on the staging and um, they had to tie a balloon to my wrist because all I was doing, they couldn't keep me still. I wanted to be free. <laughs> and they just let me run around the studio. So you could just and, see this and balloon you could see going this, around. This balloon <laughs> popping around. And they're like, there she is, there she is. <laughs> but yeah, I really didn't. I just didn't. But then what baby, once you find your feet, you don't want to be cooped up. In That's it. incredible that you're walking at eight months. They must have thought... Um, IVF babies are yeah. Prod- well, they did say when I, they did say when I was born that I could move things with my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so that is. And um, can you? Can you confirm? No, no, I can't. I wish I could because that would be absolutely epic. <laughs> but no, I can't. <laughs> um, so, do you remember growing up feeling any sort of pressure? You know, because obviously, being the first at anything, people look to you. Mm-hmm. You know, for answers, and and you're you know, an ordinary person. You're you're like everybody else. But I think sometimes when you're the first, there's 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 more scrutiny. Yeah. There's more expectation. Yeah. I mean, growing up normally as a child, I didn't take any notice because mm. children just do. Um, I think when I got to sort of my teenage years, I wanted to make sure that. For some reason, like I like the fairy tale like wedding, do you know what I mean? Like I wanted to get married in a church and I wanted to make sure I was married before I had children and it doesn't matter because it is what it is at the end of the day. But that was what like when you're growing up you sort of learn and back then that was what you did, if you know what it I mean. It was expected, and, yeah. Yeah. And I think I was just I just went with the flow and just did what everybody... I think I did what everybody thought they would want me to do, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So at what point did you kind of decide that you might start getting involved in the fertility world? Uh, You know, (coughs) speaking at, you know, coming to visit uh, clinics like you are today? Um, I've always done... We've always done... um, If Bob and Patrick wanted anything to do... Like, there was a documentary once that they wanted us to do, which we agreed to do. Mm. Um, Because while I was at school, Mum and Dad said, no, I want her to have a normal childhood, Mm. normal schooling. She's not being pulled out of school or... Unless it was anything really special. Mm. Um, So... I... I've always done things, but I think I got to my 40th. And obviously with mum and dad no longer being here, um, Bob Edwards no longer here, Jean Purdy, Patrick Steptoe. So the, the five main people that were in the room, apart from me when I was born, are no longer here. Mm. And I just thought, how can I sort of pay tribute to them and also help people? Like, I mean, there was nothing when my mum had the treatment. There was no advice. There was nothing. Whereas now you get advice. There's so many options. Mm. And... It's just to keep raising awareness and just, it doesn't matter if you have an IVF baby, we are all normal. I mean, I'm as normal as my friends and if you can call us normal, then (laughs) it's what everybody thinks is normal, isn't it? So, um, but just, I think, yeah, it was definitely my 40th and I realised I then left my, used to be a um, ship, a not a ship. <laughs> I used to be a ship. <laughs> I used to be a ship. I used to um, work with customs and um, I was a freight forwarder basically. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I used to deal with all the customs and arranging containers and getting them loaded and mm-hmm. getting them to port and things like that. And I did that as well as doing all the IVF stuff on, on my 40th year and it, it was a lot. Yeah. Because you can't be in two places at once. Yeah. And pre-COVID nobody did anything out of the office yeah now all the office stuff can go home so you can do stuff but yeah but back then I couldn't so and then I just decided no I think I want to focus on this yeah focus on IVF and just raising awareness and I mean we did um when my mum was alive we did a trip to Bulgaria and the first trip we did we went there a couple of times and the first one the actual government agreed to funding 
because you had visited. because we'd visited and that's incredible. they could see what wow. how good a good thing it was yeah um and then when we went back the next time a couple of years later they'd actually built a massive new hospital wow so it was yeah it was and obviously a lot of irish went to bulgaria for treatments yeah so it was i mean anything that helps anybody it doesn't matter what where you are in the world mm. if it, if you need ivf and you want help then yeah well, it's incredible that, that you've started doing this full time. Um, I know that you, you have a unique set of um, a fan base, I suppose. <laughs> we, we went to uh, visit the lab and um, mm. the embryologists, I don't think I've ever seen them so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I do get, um, occasionally in my hometown, I get people come up to me and they're like, so this one lady, we were in the middle of our shopping centre and I was with my husband and two children. And um, they're completely used to it now as well. Mm. Um, and we heard these steps running up behind us. And I was like, what's that? So I looked, turned around and it was this lady and this little girl. And she went, you're Louise, aren't you? And I said, Ye, sort of smiling because yeah. they've only got to say you're Louise. And I exactly know. Mm-hmm. It's like people come up to me and say, I know you from somewhere, but I don't know where. Mm-hmm. And my mind automatically, I just smile to myself and I don't say who I am or anything. I just say, oh, right, yeah. I say it's probably around Asda or somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, they came running up to me and uh, she said, oh, you're Louise. I said, yeah. She went, she said, I've lived in Bristol all my life and I know you're from Bristol. And she said, if I ever, I've said to myself, if I ever saw you, I'd want to say thank you. And I said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> And she said, no, but your parents did and you're carrying it on. She mm-hmm. said, so um, without your mum and dad, I wouldn't have my little girl. And then um, about a couple of minutes later, the, a man's strolling up with a buggy and they got like a week old baby in there and they said, this one is IVF too. And it sort of chokes you up. It does make you want to like sort of tear up and things like that. So, but it's, it's, it's that and seeing the families. Mm-hmm. And the appreciation mm. there there is as well. That's what why I love doing what I do mm. as well. A question came in, and you've kind of alluded to this that you knew, knew very early on about how you had conceived. Someone has asked, um, "How did your parents tell you? When do you remember having that first conversation, or was it just always part of the narrative in in your family home?" So obviously I was born in the July, so in my school year, Mm. I was always the youngest. Mm. So Natalie was born in the June, I was then four in the July, and sorry, I should have said Natalie is my younger sister. Also conceived (laughs) through IVF. Also conceived through IVF, so I was three, nearly four when she was born, and then I would have started school the following September. Mm. So mum and dad sat me down and showed me the video of my birth, which was all on, all recorded. Yeah. Um, it's on YouTube, you yep. can look it up and see it. And for a four-year-old, it's pretty um, gruesome. Mm. I mean, they're pulling me out, I'm screaming my head off, and there's <laughs> blood and mucus and everything everywhere. And they showed me that and said, look, Doc, um, Patrick and Bob helped make you Mm. and that was sort of it for a four-year-old that was Mm. probably quite a lot but it sort of all slotted in and made sense oh that's why there's always cameras around and things like that so and then as I grew um just sat listening to mum and dad do interviews Mm -hmm. I picked up quite a lot yeah um, if I ever had any questions that I could ask them, but I don't really think I'd, I didn't need to, mm. because sort of as my brain developed and I grew, I sort of yeah took more and more on from the interviews, and then obviously when you do sex education at school, it then the the, the final penny sort of slots in, and you mm. think ah oh, right okay. Well, you must have got better sex education in the UK <laughs> than we get over here. I'll just say that. Um, yeah, no, but I think, like, if you start speaking to children from a young age, they do get it. I mean, like, our, our kids are six and almost four, and, like, the six-year-old <coughs> could tell you more about um, fertility treatments than, than a lot of adults, I know. You know, it's it's yeah. completely normal. And, and there's the education yeah, out there now, whereas yeah. back when I was growing up, it was still fairly new. Sure. Um, another question came in and someone was asking and it's someone who's going through fertility treatment at the moment and 
they're a little bit worried that their their child might feel different because they've been conceived in a different sort of way. Um, did you feel different? And obviously things are very different now, mm. you know, because for you growing up, there was, there was one of you and then there yeah. was five of you. And yeah. then there was, you know, now there's millions and millions of babies born yeah. through IVF. Um, did you feel different? And do you feel different? Not really, no. Mm. I just, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I take my hat off to mum and dad. They... I think they raised me perfectly. Um, I couldn't have asked for better parents. Um, they tried to shield me, although they knew they couldn't fully shield me. Um, and without them, I wouldn't be who I am today. Um, and I just I d- didn't ever feel different. The only thing that used to really, really wind me up, and that was when I was about 14, and I used to lay in bed at night and it's really stupid because it's the fact that what I couldn't get my head around was that somebody over the other side of the world knows all about me, mm. knows what I look like and I know nothing about them. Mm. That was the, and that was when I was about 14, 15 and that went on for a couple of months. But I And I suppose that was nothing to do with really being conceived through IVF. It was the fact that it your, was life, just, your yeah. life was public. So yeah. the same could be said of yeah. anyone who, yeah. whose life is, is quite visible. Yeah. Yeah. So, but no, as in, I just was the same as all my friends, and and we knew that there wasn't anything wrong because of the tests. They did the hundred about a hundred tests when I was born. Even took my fingerprints because my mum, she didn't see me till the twenty sixth because back then C sections you were put out completely. Yeah. So when she by the time she came round, I think it was the twenty. It was well because I was born a couple of minutes to midnight, so it would have been the twenty sixth, probably about dinner time. I should imagine, and um, she's like, "Why is my daughter, my newborn daughter, got black, black. on her she's fingertips?" Like, is, it, is it something yeah, to what do with is, the And they, they said, "Oh, we've done all the tests and we've done her fingerprints." And my mum said, "Why have you done her fingerprints?" Mm. Well, just to prove that that there is nothing. But I haven't had a test since because they could find nothing. So, mm. but no, I don't feel different. And I'm, I mean, knowing that they couldn't find anything different to anybody else probably did help. Mm because you realise there is nothing. It is just literally the conception, and that's the only thing that's different. The first couple of days. Yep. From, from an egg to yeah. a fertilised embryo to a... Where, would, it, would it have been a three-day transfer back then? Oh, I haven't got a clue. I would have, I would have thought so. That's, nobody's ever asked yeah. me that before. There Look at go. that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't think I'd have oh, anything. Honestly, I don't know what it would have been. That would be really interesting to I find out. Try. I would assume it would have been a three-day transfer because five-day blastocysts would have been... Obviously, wouldn't, I'm not an embryologist exist, here, but I, don't, I, don't, I, I wouldn't no. have thought so. No, because it yeah. was literally basic. I mean, mum had no drugs, yeah. no nothing with me. Um, yeah. It was a completely natural cycle. It yeah. was just the fact that she had no fallopian tubes, yeah, so they that had the to, eggs couldn't yeah, yeah. travel down. Yeah. So Incredible. Well, you'll have to find that I'll out. I'll to, find yeah, that yeah, out. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. And it's like now, my friends, like, I've got a couple of friends who have had IVF and they've got children. And they've got like the pictures of when they were the embryo and it's everything. It's incredible. I didn't have anything like that. I didn't even have I a scan know. picture. Do you know what I mean? Mum didn't even have a scan well, picture. Well, to be with fair, me. you have your entire birth recorded. Yes. So, so that's pretty cool. By the government. <laughs> so yeah. Um, did you ever worry that you might have to um, have <coughs> fertility treatments? Um, no. I always got asked that hmm. from about the age of 14. Um, up, they always would ask me. Um, it's very young to be asking. Yeah, like. but I suppose they just yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It was a, it was just new. Yeah, oh, yeah, everything yeah. was new, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so yeah. they didn't. Um, and I I'd say yes, I would have had it, mm. but luckily I didn't need it. Yeah, and it wasn't anything I worried about. It still took me two years to get pregnant. Yeah, but I think that is just my system and my body. I was on the pill injection. Yeah. Um, because and that's another thing I was drummed into when I was at school don't get pregnant don't get pregnant whereas now I mean you don't want to get pregnant necessarily like but I think people are becoming more fertility aware yes and that it's not just and going I mean, to happen like the immediately freezing yeah. of eggs and everything early yeah. I mean you didn't hear anything about that when I was at mm. school that didn't that Exist. was just yeah, yeah. so um, I was always on the pill injection so I came off of that 
and it took me about two and a half years but then it was exactly the same when I just when we decided because there's seven years between my boys or six and a half and then when I decided so we were going to have Aidan um I again went on the pin injection I came off and it still took two and a half years so I think yeah. that is just my body and my system mm. but it didn't I didn't start worrying I didn't even think about it it just yeah. didn't enter my head yeah. yeah so I don't know why yeah um I know you probably get asked this a lot by you know people who you meet who maybe are on their fertility journey and it hasn't happened yet um, what what sort of advice do you give to people, whether they be an individual, a couple who are waiting for it to happen, and you know, obviously look to you as you know a symbol of mm. hope? I just my mum always said she just as soon as she met Patrick she knew, and she just believed that they would help mum have a baby. Mm. I think sort of positive thoughts I don't I don't know it's really hard because everybody's different um but no mum definitely sort of believed that it was going to happen mm. and I don't think I think probably her maybe not or not realizing the full story in the beginning probably helped and not realizing that it was really a one in a million chance yes that it would yeah. work because I think she just thought she saw Patrick, he was going to help her, and she would end up pregnant. I didn't think she thought of the negative, that mm. it wasn't going to happen, yeah. or she just positive thoughts. And yeah. Just and, yeah, and I, yeah, and I guess thankfully now, you know, the success rates obviously are, are so much higher than w what they would have been when you well, were born. And you've got much better equipment that yeah. can even sort out the embryos and things like that, whereas I, they wouldn't have had anything back then. Like it that. wouldn't have had time lapse no, incubators. No, and you think mum's mum's chance was like one egg, first try. That was incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, I just can't put down how like when you look at it and think of it like that, it's like I really shouldn't be here. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just it was a miracle that it happened and the fact that there was no drugs or no nothing it was yeah when you look at it like that yeah it's pretty scary it's absolutely <laughs> incredible it's kind of mind-blowing and, yeah. and sometimes when I think about it and I think about how my children exist and so many of our friends babies and all of the millions of, of children and mm. adults worldwide it is quite yeah. mind-blowing that if we if we didn't have those advances if you hadn't been born if they didn't continue with their trial essentially um none of this would have been possible well and also only the slightest thing to be wrong like if i would have shut down born yeah born with a cleft lip i mean mm. my so she's my niece so is natalie's daughter she's just had a little boy mm. and um, he was born with cleft lip um and palate i mean but he's the most gorgeous little boy he's had one operation he's got a couple more to go yeah um but if i would have been born with something that it, that it's, they would have deemed to be wrong. Yeah, they they would have blamed IVF, and I don't yeah. know where we'd be now. Well, I wouldn't be here. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'd be here, but yeah. You know, um, I just don't, nobody. Yeah. I just dread to think what would have happened. I know it's it's crazy. I don't. I don't. I personally don't have um a, a particular faith, but sometimes when I when I look at situations like you being here today, I feel like. Um, you know, the stars must have aligned or... Well, or, exactly. You know, I mean, there were so many happened. things yeah, against. Could have gone wrong, yeah. And, but yet nothing did. Mm. So it just, I think mum was just, it was just meant to be. Yeah. It was meant to be my mum and dad. It was meant, do you know? It's, yeah. it's just, so, yeah, like you, I've got not a particular particular faith. Um, but yeah, some somebody up there something, was looking down and happened. something yeah. happened. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely incredible. And thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been a pleasure to chat to you and yeah, such an, such an honour. So you thank you so much me. and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Dublin. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. If you have, please rate, review and subscribe. For more information on the services we offer, you can visit www.therapyfertility.com.